Hello and welcome to episode 93 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the casual spike, focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies in Modern and Pioneer. You guys still playing Pioneer? I played it today. Played it today. You can't stop me. I, actually, I did for this episode too. Oh, wow. Okay. Good, good. Keep up with the good work. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago. And with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. What's up, Stanislav? Yeah, I played Pioneer. There's a lot of thought seasons in that format. We'll talk about that later. That's called a tease in the industry, as Dave likes to say. <laughs> also with us, the godfather of teases, Dave Harbarger. Turns out I was casting thought seasons, but in a different format. I played, I played two formats. Whoa, this guy's busy. And I played poker at the same time. It's on. It's a VOD on my Twitch. Check it out. It's quite an experience. Dude, you can't tease the listeners that way because you don't Twitch and they would love it if you did. You should have You should have multi-queued poker and magic. My Saturday night poker game and a modern league at the same time. Yeah. All right. Tweet at us if you want to see it. I'll do it sometime. Some PNP. On this week's episode, it's the return of Sleeve Believe Heave. The three of us have taken a variety of decks through the MTGO gauntlet to test the impact of Zendikar Rising cards on some of our favorite decks of yesteryear. Before that, we're kicking off the show with a breakdown of the weekend's Mana Traders Modern Tournament. Before all that, though, it's time for a little segment that we like to call Housekeeping. All right, first, I'd like to thank new patrons, Kiefer. And the last god, the last god, especially. I think I don't know if Kiefer's been in the in the Slack, but getting right in there, making themselves uh, heard and seen in the super secret Slack server. Appreciate both of you all uh, joining the Dive Down Nation this past week, and also like to thank Sean D and somehow Bob P again for increasing their tiers. Bob P just continues to. I think I think he has a metal detector and just goes on the beach. And just finds like gold bullion and silver coins. And it's just like, look, the dive down, these gentlemen need this more than I do. I think Bob has earned the right to call themselves our biggest fan and president of the fan club. We don't know what Bob's motivations are. (laughs) Bob's just trying to buy us out, I think, slowly. Yeah, it's a hostile takeover going on. It's my kind of hostility, though. Exactly. And also like to thank... This is this is a challenging name. Blah Fwaf Pa Bado. So you know who you are, Blah. And also the Brain Dude 101 for their kind reviews. Uh Blah's review is is just a tome. Like if you if you have Apple Podcasts, just uh, Stan and I, when we were waiting, we were waiting for uh Dave. For my child to stop melting down. And and so I was looking at the reviews in the past week, and so I just, I just read it like in a dramatic voice and it was fun. I, I can't, it would take like three minutes to do it again on air. So I'm not going to, but go, go to Apple podcast yourself and read this in a dramatic voice. Cause it's kind of fun. Can we do dramatic readings with me doing some guitar accompaniments while you provide like a Stephen Fry narrative of our reviews? Next bonus episode is just us freestyling over review text. It's just the dive down spoken word. Yeah. Henry Rollins, eat your heart out. Diet Dr. Pepper. And if you'd like to support us as well uh, and join our community of capricious rogues on Slack, uh, check us out at patreon.com slash the dive down, where even a $1 tier entry will get you access to our Slack, super secret Slack server. You don't say that three times fast. It's a tongue twister. It's not easy. And then there's some other fun swag. And uh, we'll be pushing out some other swag in the near future, I think, as well. So we'll keep an eye on the sky for that. That's the plan. And also, you can help support us by checking out Mana Traders, uh, manatraders.com. Sign up code the dive down, all one word. Okay, so it's back to 15%. Um, they had us at 20% for a while. It looks like Mana Traders is cutting that across the board. I think it's perfectly generous to be at 20% for as long as they were. So they're going to, you know, they roll it back. So we're back to 15%. But if you want 15% off your first three months of mana trader service, the best way to rent magic online cards. Uh, I used it again today. I gave, I got cards, gave them back, got some other cards, gave those back. It's fast. It works great. It's just, it works exactly how it's supposed to. They ran the tournament. We're going to be commenting on in the breakdown. Uh, they're killing it. So uh, join up if you haven't already. Use code sign up code the dive down. 
And Stan, speaking of that Mana Traders tournament, I think you're covering it at the news desk this week. Yes, yes. Thank you, Shane. I'm going to jump right into the the tournament, but before anyone asks, we've decided not to discuss the standard ban or the secret lair because it doesn't really impact the content of our show, or at least the, the topics we usually cover. Yet. So we're aware. We're just sort of not impressed. <laughs> Uro, Uro is no longer protected. Okay. This what this what this means is Uro is no longer financially protected by Watsi. There to be selling Omnaths to care about Uros. So watch this space for future Uro bands. Yeah. But until then, let's talk about the Mana Traders Modern Tournament. Some of our patrons were in that event. I think a lot of known players participated in this as always. And Mana Traders was very generous to provide us with access to a bunch of the raw data from the weekend. But you can also see a lot of great coverage from the tournament uh, that was done by our friends from MTG Grindcast, CCR, Lee McLeod, McLeod, McLeod. Yep. And and Collins Mullen was back to do coverage of this event. So you can find that over at twitch.tv slash mana traders. But for this episode, I made some pivot tables. My man. Of course. That's right. And look, we had 22 players in the event. That was a lot of data to pour over. And I have a full-time job. So I just looked at the top 32. I think that was kind of a sensible way to make the most out of my time. So we're going to look at the top 32. We're going to talk about the top eight and then some additional broad metagame observations as well. In the top 32, pretty diverse field. We actually had five decks span the top 50%. And that was the tied for the two most popular decks in the top 32 was Red Black, Death Shadow, and Five Color Humans. Both of those uh, put up five copies in the top 32. Humans is back for real. And I think it's worth noting that those two decks, not to jump ahead, but it fits neatly with the broader metagame. Both of those decks were at the top of the broader metagame of the entire 220 players also tied with each other at 10% of the field. The third most popular deck in the top 32 with three copies was Uro Pile. <laughs> okay. Still here. Any particular thoughts about any of the Uro lists or is it looking kind of normal? It was looking pretty normal. Like we're talking about Field of the Dead control shenanigans. Uh, there was also after that a couple copies of Sultai Control, which I didn't put that into the Uro pile category, but there were also more Uro Uros there in the Sultai decks. Also, we had Dredge and Amulet Titan with two copies, and then a bunch of one-offs, including Yogmoth. Uh, is it As Foretold, these new Oops All Spells decks, Mono White Heliod, Green White Titan, Green White Scales, Belcher, Bantfield, you name it. A lot of diversity in the weekend's tournament. It was a pretty impressive event to watch. I would just say really quickly, by the way, that, yeah, this does look like pretty interesting. There's a lot of Uro up here at the top, but you know I always like to see a couple of aggro decks hanging in there too, and that's what we had. Also, if you missed watching the coverage of this, I think it's worth it. It was it was nice to watch a live event. It was good coverage from our friends at the Grindcast, and so just to reemphasize what we said earlier, give it a chance when one of these is on if it's a format that you like because they are, Mana Traders is putting some effort into these things, and so I, th- I think the content is good. Yeah, I, I even think that the effort they put into these tournaments is why we went from 20% to 15%. And I think it's a worthy trade. Sp- <laughs> spread the wealth. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> you know what? The world is hungry for content right now, Stan. I don't I don't know if you've heard. I have. All right. So that's the top 32. You know, when when the two most popular decks are only 15 slash 16%, I think that's okay. But let's look at the top eight. I have the top eight deck lists. And I know who came in first and second. I actually couldn't figure out the rest of the top eight spread. So Hmm. decks three through eight will be in no particular order. But the winner, mid-determinist, on a fairly stock list with no new cards, running Crabvine. Hmm. Unreal. (laughs) I watched this tournament. I watched the the finals of the tournament. And as I was watching Crabvine go through the top eight, I was just like, what is going on? This is incredible i will say one of the things that i didn't realize was going on in this particular deck at this point is that this deck also runs everybody's favorite titan uro so oh, does it? yes it does and so you you get a little bit of a mid kind of grind plan 
off of it where you can, you have a lot more options than maybe it feels like Crabvine used to have or you would expect it to have, where it's not just kind of like an all in aggro reanimator deck. It's also able to bring Uro back a couple of times. You know, every deck that runs this kind of graveyard mechanic now buys time with creeping chill against aggro decks and in fact that's that turned out to be really pivotal in the uh in the final uh, as well so um you know this deck has more of a long game than i think people gave it credit for i'm not sure if it's like the way to do dredge because essentially it is dredge in in a lot of ways similar strategy anyway um but it's kind of like mid dredge and mid-range dredge instead of aggro dredge sort of does the new Ruin Crab only target opponents? Correct. That's why they were still on the original four crabs? Yeah. Yeah, I sat there for like a good 40 minutes wondering that same question before it dawned on me that Ruin Crab only does opponents. Now, it says it doesn't say target, so that's one of the good things about the new crab is that it, it gets through like Leyline and stuff like that, but um, can't run it in this deck. In second place, new HJ on Mono Red prowess this is the obosh deck again no new cards in the 75 yeah big surprise to me that there was no zendikar cards in either one of these finalists are we just comfortable saying that the obosh red prowess deck is is kind of taking over from the metamorphose deck that we just thought was the way this deck was meant to be built built rather well i don't know if it's necessarily the correct way to build it in general, but I think this is just another aggressively slanted prowess deck that probably has game against certain matchups and less game against others. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that over the weekend, uh, M. Hayashi, who's sort of widely credited with yeah. designing this deck, is not playing Obosh anymore. In fact, and was experimenting with other things in, in the deck, including some two drops. Namely, Magmatic Channeler. Yes, which we're going to talk about that a little bit later in for for a minute but it was interesting to see that that they've moved on a little bit so i think it's just one of those things where like mono red prowess is good pick your flavor i i will say that these more aggressive -y ones feel like they're much more prevalent in the metagame now than blue red uh for sure and certainly we never saw blue green much again after we did that one episode about it so i think it's really coming down to right now are you mono red or are you kind of like rakdos luris aggro and that's where prowess is at right now so i do think it's more aggro -y and less tempo than some of the decks that we looked at when we did our prowess deep dive yeah that said i think if humans remains you know one of the most popular decks out there although any version of prowess is good the gutshot lava spike version is also in that category like i like having gut shots and lava lava darts in my deck when i'm playing against humans so like i could see is it picking back up eventually or spike field hazard which actually some of these decks are starting to play as well which is supposed to be good against humans but we'll see hmm. all right then in no particular order from third to eighth we had red black shadow piloted by al nash who in the swiss if i'm reading the data correctly had a hundred percent match win percentage yeah this is the one person that went 9-0 in the swiss and no spoilers because this is the deck i'm talking about this week <laughs> Deck featured several new cards beyond the four Scourge of the Skyclave. We also had a copy of Agadim's Awakening in the main, a couple Feed the Swarm in the sideboard, and it is a Luris deck, which I think is true of all of these red-black uh, shadow decks. They're all running Luris now. Correct. And also, I said I said no spoilers, Stan, but, so now I have nothing to talk about later. You just, you just <laughs> did the whole thing. I think I think you'll find a way to fill the time. I'm also really liking the Apostles Blessing technology that I'm seeing in a lot of these decks to give, you know, some of your pretty vulnerable creatures protection from like fatal push while also managing your life total a little bit because they are never paying white mana for that blessing. Yeah, I'll talk about that some more too, but I think it's got other uses beyond that. So we also have Oops All Spells in the top eight. This is kind of like that Belcher deck that we touched on last week, but now Belcher is in the sideboard, and this one's all in on Balustrade Spy and Undercity Informer. Yeah, a lot of people have been calling this deck Undercity Combo. Yeah, I think it's fair to call it a combo. Um, I'll actually be talking about like the Pioneer variants of this deck in the Dive Down segment. What I what's what's cool about this deck is a lot of ways to get a lot of power on the battlefield really quickly. Like it has some ramping elements and it has, of course, cards like, you know, Vengevine that are part of these aggressive graveyard strategies pretty typically. Of course, it has like, you know, your prized amalgams and whatnot. So 
what this deck is essentially trying to do is cast a balustrade spy and have it resolve to get its ETB or have Undercity Informer on the battlefield and use its one generic mana activated ability to say, mill yourself until you hit a land. You don't have any lands in your deck, right? And this is kind of going to be redundant with the dive down segment, but that just means you mill your whole deck. When you mill your whole deck, a bunch of stuff happens. In this deck, you have Narc Amoebas and you know, other typical cards like Creeping Chills and, and whatnot that do things like trigger your prize amalgams, trigger your um, Silver Smoke Ghouls. What a really cool tech here is Narc Amoeba plus Sword of the Meek. And so what Sword of the Meek does is when Narc Amoeba ETBs, it brings along the Sword of the Meeks attached to it, okay? And then what you can do is there's a Singleton Salvage Titan, which you can sacrifice You can sacrifice the three Sword of the Meek to bring back the Salvage Titan out of the graveyard. Uh, because that is the second creature cast trigger, that then triggers Vengevine. Because the first cast trigger is your Balustrade Spy or Undercity Informer, typically, right? And then you mill everything, you get your Narcomibas back, you get the Sword of the Meeks back, you get your Salvage Titan back, that triggers Vengevine, and then you just have a lot of aggression on the battlefield. So let's say, Shane, you're in a position where you can't swing for the kill that turn. How do these players keep from dying for milling themselves out? This deck, so the, the Pioneer version has different tech than this deck. Um, one of the main ways is Nexus of Fate right? Because it just gets shuffled back into your library. So you always have the ability to have like at least one card in your library. And I'll talk about the way the Pioneer variant does it later, which is weird because it doesn't use Nexus of Fate, at least yet. Yeah. I mean, this is all about you, you get two turns to attack, basically. Mm-hmm. If something goes wrong, you have another turn to attack. But keep in mind, like the modern one is also, of course, packs Creeping Chill. And so you are likely to do a bunch of of work on top of uh, to your opponent's life total off of those. It has four of them. You, you mill your whole deck, you get that going on. And then it's really just like this wild combo that happens. It's interesting that this does not use out of the sideboard. It uses Belcher and it doesn't try to use Thassa's Oracle somehow, which I guess you can't really do if you can't stack your deck, like you can in the Belcher deck. So maybe that makes sense. But the mill is all about this weird combo with the, Narco Amoebas plus the Sword of the Meek into Salvage Titan into uh, Venge Vines. We also had a couple copies of Humans in this top eight. Season of Mists was playing a very stock list with no new cards as far as I can tell. And then Tridon was playing a fairly stock list, but it had four Skyclave Apparition in the sideboard. Um, And spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about Skyclave during the dive, but... I have a feeling we might be seeing Skyclave move out of those sideboards eventually. Hmm. Card's good. We had Zack Attack 23 on an Uro pile with a single copy of Omnath. And the only other new cards in the 75 were a couple Cleansing Wildfire in the sideboard. And this was really a four color control Uro pile that had like Ren and Six, Jace. Big and Little to Fairies, as well as Hour of Promise and Field of the Dead. And finally, Mono White Heliod made the top eight, featuring four Skyclave Apparition and four Luminarch Aspirant main. Cool to see this deck stick around. I have a feeling it's going to just kind of be a, a modern mainstay for a little while. Not only because it's got this infinite combo kill with Heliod and Walking Ballista, but like some of this new technology it picked up in Zendikar is super powerful. Wow, what a call. Heliod on the upswing in modern. All right, some other observations we had from the tournament data that was shared with us. In terms of the overall tournament metagame breakdown, 10% of the entire weekend was Rakdo Shadow and another 10 was Humans. Both had 22 copies in the 220 people that played. Decks are good. What are you going to do? With 12 copies or 5.5%, we had Ponza. 5% with 11 copies, we had 4 Color Control, which I think is what we're calling an Uro pile here. Mm -hmm. And then 4.5% with 10 copies was Jund, which is a black, red, green mid-range strategy using cards like Tarmogoyf, Thoughtseize, and Liliana the Veil to gradually two-for-one your opponents, 
Never heard of it. That can't possibly be powerful enough in today's modern. Well, you know what, Shane? I will have you know that uh, they also shared a little bit of a metagame win rate for these decks. And Jund had a very powerful performance over the weekend with 51% win rate. That's better than 50. Yeah, that's one more percent than I needed to be convinced to play Jund. And uh, the rest of the win rates were pretty interesting for these decks, I'll say, though. So out of the Swiss, the top performing deck was Rakdos Shadows with 58 and a quarter percent win rate. Pretty high, almost 60. Number two was Humans with 57%. So both of these aggro decks that were well represented in the top 32, not as many Rakdos lists in the top eight, but there were two Humans lists in the top eight. Both of them were close to 60% win rate in general Swiss. But let's talk about a couple of the losers from the metagame. I love talking the losers. Gruel Midrange, a deck that I think a lot of people thought had some legs coming into this tournament. 38% win rate. Pretty surprising. I and mean, that's pretty low. Uh, it makes me wonder. I think generally people would think that Ponza was pretty good against humans. So it makes me wonder if it has a rough time against Rakdos Shadow for some reason, which would also be a little bit of a surprise to me. I think that's probably the case because as long as Rakdos can fetch up one swamp, like I don't think they're ever casting anything for black black, but also a lot of their creatures just get out of bolt range so quickly and these decks aren't running Glorybringer as often anymore. So, you know, as long as you can like beat a, what's that new green monster? Elder G. As long as you can beat an Elder Gargaroth, Gargadon, whatever, Elder Gary. I, I, I think like Ponza might actually have a really tough matchup with Rakdo Shadow. And, and frankly, I seem to recall that I used to have a really hard time playing against Grixis Shadow when I was on Ponza as well, just because like Thought Season Inquisition is quite good, especially in turns one and two. Yeah, this deck is, is pretty different from Grixis Shadow, but it does have some similar tools for sure. It's much closer to Prow- Rakdos Prowess than it is to Grixis Shadow, let's say. But it does still have Thought Seize. And that ability to get a swamp is important, like you said. There are no double black pip spells there are a few. I mean, there's there's Agony's Awakening, which has three black pips, and there's Luris, which has two. But, you know, those have bailouts or conditions that make them not dead draws, and so you can get your threats still out. So may, maybe that matchup is a little bit worse than I thought it would be, was going to be looking at it. Yeah. And I think Agadim's Awakening is just a one-of in a lot of these decks. So, like... For sure. Your fail state is you, you get an untapped mana. Yeah. And then the other deck that had a surprisingly low win percentage was Four Color Control. Yeah, 43.75. That's not great. Who's afraid of that ghost? I ain't afraid of no Titan. (laughs) This might be just what happens when everyone is prepared for Uro, maybe. Like, maybe the evidence there is that Uro is just, like, beatable. I mean, that's, that's what I take away from it. And hope that that's true. I mean, when people talk about banning Uro in Modern, look, it's a really annoying card. There's no, I have no doubt about that. But uh, when I see a result like this with, you know, some of these decks might have had Omnath in them, which is another card people are up in arms about. Um, I think that I feel okay about Modern pushing forward mostly the way that it is as far as Uro and Omnath go. Now, the All Spells decks... Those still make me a bit more concerned, but we'll talk about that later on. But um, yeah, I was both surprised and not going to lie, a little happy to see four color control come out on sub forty, uh, sub uh, fifty percent. All right, one last tidbit that I thought was pretty interesting. I downloaded all the raw data from this tournament, made a pivot table, and did a breakout of the ten most popular non land cards. I'll, I'll have you know that like. I think Basic Mountain was among the 10 most popular cards, but (laughs) I filtered all that stuff out. And the single most popular card for the 15th year running was Lightning Bolt. 112 copies were registered. Nice. I'm sure that has something to do. I mean, Rakdos, Gruul, and Jund were all there towards the top of the metagame, so I'm sure that helped. Yeah. Yeah. There is an interesting trend here because the second and third most popular non-land cards were Fatal Push and Path to Exile. And then the fifth most popular card was Dismember, which kind of leads me to this question for you guys. What do you make of this fact that four of the five most played cards in this event were removal spells? Is that a healthy signal? I mean, I think it's pretty normal for Bolt, Push, and Path to be towards the top yeah, of the... Always, almost always. Almost always, I think they are in modern these these days. This top five is pretty... The, Dismember is a bit surprising 
to me, just in the sense that this implies that a lot of people are running it main deck. And I'm assuming that it's shadow decks running. I mean, for the most part, those Racto shadow decks are running two copies a piece main deck. And because it's a great removal spell and it also helps with matchups like Ponza and it helps manage your life total. So I think that that's part of why that shot up so high this time. The number four spell on this list, which Stan skipped over because it's not a removal spell, was Thoughtseize, which I think is also, you know, notable. That's saying something. Well, but like when Shadow, when I, uh, a shadowy deck is towards the top of the list, you know, that's, it's interesting because there's there's 22 of decks there in Racto Shadow, and that means that not all of those were even running four copies, which is kind of surprising. I see what you're saying, yeah. We also had Vela Summer in the top 10, Aethergust, Field of the Dead, and Relic of Progenitus, and one new card, which really surprised me, 48 copies of Cleansing Wildfire. Wow. So just right in there. Yeah, I mean, again, I think this is Racto Shadow swaying the metagame a lot because that was running between two and four copies in the sideboards, I believe. At least the build that I played had four straight up in the sideboard, which was interesting, and I, I think that there are others with that many so when you have 22 from one deck you can have this sideboard tech kind of get out of whack pretty fast any parting thoughts how does this make you feel does it make you feel good about modern does it give you an idea of like what you'd want to play in modern right now hmm i mean i'm, I'm pretty happy right like we don't see the earl piles dominating the fact that humans and shadow are back up to like 15 percent each in a tournament like this and the top 32 are pretty impressive the metagame is pretty dynamic week over week i think people are able to play what they want which is always like a good sign of a format right i think people are having success in a lot of different decks i'm fascinated with some of the you know the way that decks will quickly drop off i think people have similar play styles like if, if someone has a particular play style i think people are willing to drop a deck if they think something is better at what it's trying to do like this, uh, Racto shadow deck. I'm guessing a lot of people who like playing like an aggressive prowess style strategy could pivot to something like this because it's, you know, it's aggressive. It plays red burn spells. Dave's making a face right now. He's going to say he doesn't think it plays similar at all. I'm guessing later on. No, I'm just going to say, I feel like you're talking about me because this is where my, my mindset is right now is like, I played this deck, then I saw what the metagame was, and I was like, yeah, this deck is sweet. I played against it a ton on Magic Online, and uh, it turns out a lot of people wanted to play it this weekend. So mm. that's where I'm at, at least for now. I don't know if there's a reason that it's at the top of the, the meta percentage at moment, a specific one, but um, I like it. I'm going to reserve some questions about that deck in particular for your segment later Please on, do. Dave. But Shane, I feel like there's three modern decks that I associate with you. And that's humans, Tron, and uh, Dredge. And it looks like humans, very popular right now, perhaps the best that's been all of 2020, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah, or at least the, or at least played more because people are thinking it's better. Well, well, it's putting up results. Like that win percentage is, is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, 60% is quite good, or nearly 60% is quite good. Um, yeah, I'll take it. Three weeks ago, Canister won, or placed in a modern challenge with humans if there was ever a time to play humans i think it's right around now i i guess my question the reason i brought that up is like how does that make you feel as a player and why aren't you just like doing backflips and foiling out your humans deck <laughs> um i mean i don't know like I, I guess i just don't i don't need results to always back up the decks that i have chosen to purchase and like be interested right like you know, when I'm when I'm playing modern, like the what I like playing is just like I, I will I will play dredge at a LGS just because I like messing with the, the physical manipulation of the cards. You know what I mean? Like I just like moving the cards around and like there's a lot al there's always fair players at LGSs. So it's just fun to like cheese out the 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 fair players. No, but I am happy, Stan. Like I think it's good. I love the fact that like, you know, when Tron is down then humans can be up like those are not polar opposites by any means, but just an example of like the, the metagame is dynamic card power does fluctuate new cards uh, impact the metagame in a way that even goes past. If the deck itself gets a card, 
because things are shifting in such ways that you know the pieces are moving around and allows people to take advantage of of gaps in the meta or opportunities in the meta. And I think that we continue to see that in modern. And I think that's why people are so into it this year as a format. Stan, how about you? Where where are you at right now? Because these decks don't look so much like your decks. Well, I mean, I like Prowess and I have a soft spot for Death Shadow as a card. So part of me kind of wants to try that Red Black Shadow deck out, though I never, ever played Luris Shadow before companions were nerfed. And it kind of felt like a blind spot in my like development as a Magic player, which ultimately has no consequences because that deck just was like totally nerfed as well. It, it also wasn't the best, best Luris deck by a long shot, unfortunately, even though it was good in Shadow. Like, there were other decks that were better with Luris than Shadow was, you know? And now I think it's really good because you have the time to get Luris, you know, to use Luris well. And so it's gotten less popular in decks like Burn, but more popular in decks like Jund and, Racto- and uh, Shadow. So, yeah. To answer your question, Dave, I'm pretty interested by all the stuff that's happening in White's Color Pie right now. Um, and we saw that with Mono White Heliod. That's a deck that, like, because it's playing eight copies of these new cards and it has, like, a combo so powerful it had to be banned in Pioneer. I think that kind of, like, captures my imagination. So I'm going to see what's happening there. I might try that deck out a little bit. But really, it all depends on what sort of homework we have to do for next week. I think for now, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, it's a Sleeve Believe Heave week. We're all going to talk about decks we played using new cards old cards cards that just came out like within the last six months stay with us all right and we're back i hope the listeners haven't gotten sick of me just yet because i'm going to kick off this dive down to talk about a little deck that i like to call mono white taxes i think a lot of people like to call it that yeah it's kind of like i thought the name of it well, so, sometimes people call it Death and Taxes. Sometimes people back in the day called it Thalia Stompy. But I pulled a, it's a different deck, Dan. Yeah, I'll t- I should talk about some of those differences. And I pulled this deck list from uh, QB Turtle, who I think got like a, a top 16 with it in a recent modern challenge. And the reason I picked it out is because it ultimately let me try out a handful of new cards at once, including an update to one of my favorite cards in modern, which was Stoneforge Mystic. Um, And, you know, as a player who tries to study magic, you know, being a content creator fits into that as well. I often feel a lot of sympathy for the reputation that white cards and decks have in the game, especially in modern. And for some reason, I can't really explain it, but I always look forward to this day where white is no longer the obvious worst color in modern and and or magic. Um, And I guess on some level, I expect that to be an exciting turning point for the game at large. So I'll touch back on this a little later, but I also picked this deck in part because I just appreciated that it was a pretty clear, linear, relatively aggressive deck that also let me make, you know, some thoughtful decisions in how I sequence spells, as well as maybe unlocking some internal synergies to potentially outplay my opponents and really ultimately play just good old fair magic. So I have a question for you. How how do you think that Stoneforge Mystic became one of your favorite cards to play with? Because it's not a card that you were like around for the first time that it was around. What what do you think happened there? So when it was unbanned, I really I already had a lot of the blue white control deck in modern. And then once it fit in there and really changed the identity of that deck and, and ultimately changed the plan of that deck. I just found that I love the play patterns that that creature enables. And I love just getting to be in these positions where I have to decide, what sword do I want to get? Do I get Batter Skull? How do I hold up Stoneforge mana as well as maybe holding up interactive mana? So it's the type of card that lets me make interesting decisions while also letting me potentially tap into a proactive game plan, while also sometimes actually even playing like a draw-go control strategy. So it just has a lot of soup stewing in that pot. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, this is your first time playing, one of your first times playing around with the Taxis Shell, right? Is this one of your first times playing around with the Thalia plus Leonin Arbiter kind of deck? I don't think so. So I can't recall if we did an episode on it or what, but there was a 
point in our history when we talked about Thalia Stompy, and I definitely rented it online okay. for some reason. I played it during during a dive down that we did. I think I talked about it on the Chalice of the Void episode that we did, where we talked a little bit about Mono Red Prison and a little bit about uh, Thalia Stompy as two decks that run Chalice. Yeah, so maybe it was then. Long story short, this wasn't totally novel to me, and guys, I played against this deck and lost to it so so many times like all those times i was playing control at the lgs and someone would bring out some variety of death and taxes i usually lost that exchange Hmm. but we talked about stoneforge and we really talked about this card a little bit last week but uh, one of the new cards in taxes that captured my imagination was mall of the skyclave a new equipment that costs two and a white when it enters, you can attach it to target creature you control, so that first equip cost is free. And then it gives equipped creature plus two, plus two, flying and first strike. Additional equips cost two white, white. So Sky Mall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Shane, just keep bringing the jokes back. I love it. Week of the week. <laughs> it's a fan favorite. That's What's it. your favorite thing you've ever seen in Sky Mall? You got anything? I like the little gnomes a lot, mm-hmm. like the, the lawn ornaments. Um, I also like, I like all of the laser, uh, hair restoration things. Mm -hmm. Like that helmet with all the internal LED lights. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of the weird, like yard section in Sky Mall. Like when I'm flying around in a plane, like that's what I'm thinking about is my yard. The other thing that I also loved about Sky Mall was that they had a globe that you could open up that had a bar inside of it. And it was one of the only places that I ever saw that. And I'm still, that's one of my great ambitions is to have a room where I want a globe that has a bar inside of it. So I can just invite people into the drawing room and open it and serve them cognac, I guess. Look at my, look at my globe bar. Yeah. Here's a take. Oh Sharper image walked so Sky Mall could fly. Yeah, you're <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, in addition to Sky Mall, I've been hearing a lot of buzz all over the Magic Verse about Sky Clave Apparition. Yeah, this card's the real deal, and it's been showing up all over the place. I've been seeing it in Blue White Spirits, including a top eight Blue White Spirits deck in the weekend's Modern Challenge, or one of them. We're seeing it pop up in humans, various soul herder strategies, various Orzhov midrange. And I even saw it in like an Abzan flicker strategy as well, I think from the 5-0 dump last week. And this is one white white for a 2-2 core spirit. Does not have flying. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target non-land permanent you don't control with CMC four or less. And then it's just exiled. But when Skyclave leaves the battlefield... The exiled card's owner creates an XX blue illusion creature token where X is the CMC of the exiled card. So they never get the card back, but if they can answer Skyclave, it'll they'll get back like a a one one two two three three or a four four. Yeah, I mean this card is as good as we expected, I think, and perhaps even better. I think the fact that it is only white is allowing it to fit in a few more shells than we anticipated i think people sort of looked at it as maybe like a sideways upgrade or you know a potential upgrade to something like deputy of detention but the fact that it's only in white allows it to see play in more than just azorius and azorius space like three or four color decks so i think that that is really allowing it to to do more and i think it's another one of those cases where i don't think people were necessarily down on the card but i think it's easy to compare it to an existing card and not even think about the colors that are required for it. Like, oh, yeah, it's like Deputy of Detention. That's pretty cool. But look, this is this only needs white to be cast, okay? Yeah, more on that later, I'm sure. All right, there was a third new card in this deck, and this one is a bit unassuming. And it's not really the type of card that would usually catch my attention, but because it's in the deck, I am excited to talk about it. And that is Archon of Emeria, two white for a two, three flying Archon which is like a like a hawk like a horse hawk I think it's the spirit on it by the way the archon I think is the like spirit of vengeance or righteous fighting ability in magic Oh yeah there it is Yeah I think the hawk is is just incidental Oh this is like a mantis rider scenario mantis rider. I think I think it is yeah The archon rides the hawk 
to the fight. I think that's a griffin, by the way. But jumps off the griffin, uh, glows a little bit, <laughs> and then gets back on the griffin and flies away. Yeah, so it does some really powerful stuff in that glowing phase. Yeah, I mean, Nissa Ravain says that Archons dispense justice according to an ancient and flawed premise. And that is that they are birds and not angry spirits. I, I do like that the griffin, its eyes are glowing too. So maybe the, the combined creatures together make the archon. It's like a toy from the 80s where like when you when you lock it on the back of the griffin, then like the battery inside it, like the two metal metal like prongs touch each other and the eyes illuminate and it goes like. Krah! Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's got one of those the, toys that the, gave us lead poisoning though, right? Yes. It's got the warg mind or whatever Bran could do in Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I still haven't read this card, but I will now. Each player cannot cast more than... I've read this to you. Oh, you mean... I thought you meant you've never read it in your entire life. He just played a deck with it. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean he read it. No, I meant I haven't read it out loud on the podcast. Okay. Uh, d- if you need to hear us read Archon of Amiria, just tweet at, at the dive down. Don't tweet. I'm doing it. Each player cannot cast more than one spell each turn and non-basic lands that your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. I mean, combination of Rule of Law and Thalia Heretic Cathar. Yep. It's pretty good. Extra val- two abilities on one card plus flying. So Shane, before you ask what I'm doing with all these new cards, I know your mind immediately goes to, Stan, what are you taking out though? And I'm here to tell you what's been replaced. You know, as we kind of mentioned, taxes has taken a lot of different forms in the past throughout modern's history. Usually it's based in white, often with a splash for one other color. Um, it's More often than not, it's only one other color because the deck doesn't want to run fetch lands due to lean and arbiter in the main. So what we've seen in the past include like Eldrazian Taxes, which is a taxes strategy that has cards like Thought Not Seer, Reality Smasher, and, and most importantly, Eldrazi Displacer. Uh, for a while, this deck was even called Thalia Stampy, since it eschewed all of its one mana spells for a playset of Chalice of the Void, as well as some of the historic decks I found in this category had a full grip of spirit, Simeon Spirit Guides to turbo out Chalice on one. Yeah, well, it also was for turboing out Leon and Arbiter on one. So you could, and it had Gemstone Caverns. Thalia. Yeah, it had Gemstone Caverns for the same reason. So it was all about getting something oppressive out on turn one. Yeah, so these were like red white taxes decks in, in some cases. Yeah. There is also Black White Taxes, which I think is perhaps the most popular historic Death and Taxes deck. This one would run Tide Hollow Sculler or Wasteland Strangler. It also ran more removal spells as well as some really powerful sideboard cards like Kunaros and Kumball. The Black White Taxes was often very much the Eld- was Eldrazi a lot as well. So it was sort of like it ran Thought Not and Reality Smasher as well normally. It's worth noting too that these a lot of these decks are Aether Vial decks. You know, the um the Thalia Stompy one was not, but the the other ones were as well. And so they're really trying to use that kind of mana acceleration and also trickiness that you get from having Aether Vial be able to do something like flash and a flicker wisp or or something like that to to kind of make some stuff happen there. Mm-hmm. And the other one I found in the history of taxes, which pops up just, you know, from time to time, though we've been actually seeing it a little bit in the last week or two, is green-white taxes, which featured cards like Noble Hierarch, Eternal Witness, Knight of Autumn, sometimes even Knight of Autumn in the main deck. And as I see it, the idea behind all these taxes variants comes down to which splash gives you access to the best tools for a particular metagame. I, I think that's like table stakes when we talk about varieties of a deck. And while testing Mono White, I really wanted to consider how the deck and perhaps some of these new cards relate to some of the benefits that a splash color might have provided in the past. So is it able to grind as well as the green deck? Can it maybe interact as well as the black decks? Or does it have finishers that are as big and strong as Eldrazi? Yeah, I mean, the other thing that we shouldn't understate here, too, is that one of the main things that these Taxus decks want to do is attack your opponent's mana base similar to the way that a Ponza might or a deck that runs Blood Moon does, but they have different tools to do it, right? So they either make spells more expensive to cast, hence the taxes part, Thalia fits into that, or they make it harder for them to um, fetch their fetch lands with Leon and Arbiter, which is a super important card. And a limiting factor for the deck getting popular in a lot of ways has been the fact that there's really only one Leon and Arbiter uh, effect 
available in modern. And so people haven't been able to do it. And then it always runs a lot of lands that kill lands. So you have your ghost quarter and your field of ruin, both of which get a lot better if you are, uh, if you have Leon and Arbiter out and it's hard for your opponents to search up those replacement lands. Yeah. So it, it costs two mana to uh, pay the Leon and tax. And if you have, you know, ghost quarters out and your opponents are tapped out, those ghost quarters are wastelands. Same with field of ruin. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's worth noting that like lean in arbiter against a deck that has a lot of fetch lands. If you drop it early and they're not expecting it, you kind of can just win. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, because you just if, buy so much tempo that like it takes them forever to get the resources they need to cast their spells. And by then you're executing whatever your plan is. Right. So that's, that's a key part of the deck that's not necessarily improved by the new cards, but supported perhaps. Right. All right. So how do these new cards feel? I actually want to start with my most excited and perhaps hyperbolic take. <laughs> I love hyperbole. Shane, well-known lover of hyperbole. I'm ready for it. I think Skyclave Apparition is perhaps the best mono-white creature in modern right now. And not only that, I predict it's going to be a format staple until it is eventually outclassed. Okay, sure. End of line. This card is incredible not only do i think it's going to be a format staple i think it's already kind of showing the signs that it is today because we're seeing it in so many decks starting in the sideboard and now moving into the main i mean thalia might want to have a word with you but i can kind of see where you're going okay well before we have this thalia skyclave grudge match hear me out yeah there's definitely certain matchups where the skyclave does not shine and in my testing at least in modern i felt like those were actually the exception and not the norm at least in today's metagame. And some of the things that I specifically noticed that it's weak to were like colorless cards, uh, reality smashers, basically anything meaningful out of Tron. Uh, Batter Skull would be a problem card and like randomly Gurmog Angler would be a really hard card for me to deal with if I couldn't find a path to exile. Yeah, but it's a large spread of threats that it covers. Yeah, I mean, I was barely ever worried about my opponent's permanence because CMC four or less tags basically every other meaningful creature in modern including like really sticky threats like clothis uh or uro and it even got me like a nice value bomb namely omnath and like thought not seer perhaps not the best card in eldrazi tron being able to answer that definitely helped me like have some game against etron although i kind of felt like that was a bad matchup but more on that later it tags karn the great creator and snaring bridge uh, Little Teferi, Jace, Liliana of the Void gets all of these like really important planeswalkers. Um, if, in fact, this feels like a huge ad for modern, especially because so much of the format's power is coalesced around cheap cards, and that's kind of like what makes our perhaps our favorite format have its identity. And I suspect that the games where it's just a three mana two two are likely poor matchups anyway, where a Taxa style deck likely would have struggled to win regardless of what. It's playing in its three CMC slot, whether it's Skyclave Apparition or like Big Thalia or or uh, Eldrazi Displacer. Mm -hmm. I was testing this deck with friend of the show and our patron Martin, uh, who mentioned something that I thought was worth sharing, which is that this card's power is a little reminiscent of what made Oko such a pain in the butt in that it effectively erases all the text on a card. And I think... When we see effects like that, you sort of have to take notice of what they're capable of because so much of the value in like a lot of contemporary cards and as well as like cards of yore in modern is all the text in that box. So when you can like turn a powerful creature or a planeswalker or any other permanent into just like a vanilla 2-2 two, two or 3-3, three, three, you're probably actually gaining advantage in that game. Yeah, I think the real advantage I see here, Stan, is is like what you said is that it it eliminates the original threat which is everything and that's why I was hyped on this for our, our spoiler episode I think importantly too is that it is a spirit and like when you know you don't have any spirit synergies in, in your deck but that's one reason that it does see play in you know pioneer spirits it's making modern spirits like a, a potential thing again and so it has that the, the tribal pump Plus, just the raw power, I think, is is a is a thing there that makes it even better. And so, like, you get a lot of value out of this for three mana, right? Like, you you get to have it come down potentially as a tribal 
two two that is pumped by one or more lords or something like that, and that's pretty awesome. And even if it's removed, like you still get the value because, like you said, is like you essentially erased a text box. Yeah, I, I do want to talk really quickly about a couple other things about this card in this specific deck. And that is that one of the big things about these taxes decks is that they can leverage um, really powerful comes into play abilities on non flash creatures because of Aether Vile. And it's a really important thing to think about when you are considering picking up this deck, or playing this deck, is that, you know, one of the key plays that you do used to do in taxes was like flashing a, a flicker wisp to do something on your opponent's term at a more kind of advantageous time than you can normally cast it because it's it doesn't have flash. And I think being able to exile a card with Skyclave Apparition at, at flash speed with Aether Vial is pretty awesome. And similarly, being able to blink your uh, Skyclave Apparition with a Flicker Wisp at the same time is another really big play that you can do. And you can do it for cheap if you have Aether Vial and not a lot of, even if you don't have a lot of lands. There might be some trigger stacking that you can do. I was doing some research on rules just now. We were looking where, you know, I don't know if you guys remember playing with um, old cards like uh, Fiend Hunter, where you would bring Fiend Hunter into play while its exile trigger is on the stack. You bring in, you flash and flicker wisp, flash the, the apparition out. You get the exile trigger that goes off. There's no card under it. Then the exile trigger happens. Then flicker comes back into play. You know, like there's there's stuff that you can do there that you used to be able to do with the old cards. That it's a little unclear to me whether you get an extra bonus out of doing that with um, with Skyclave apparition or not. So please consult your judge friends and find out. <laughs> wow. But being able to to do these cards at instant speed is very good and a reason to play them with Aether Vial and a, a reason that this deck makes a lot of sense. And why I suspect that this deck even goes to the lengths of playing like Restoration Angel, which is a card you don't see in modern a whole lot these days, but it's really powerful with these come into play abilities like this. Totally. And in fact, I think the synergy between Skyclave and Flicker Wisp not only makes Skyclave exceptionally powerful in this strategy but it makes flicker wisp relatively more powerful in this strategy as well because you know flicker wisp is often like played as a tempo spell to maybe clear out blockers that your opponents might have but when you're using it to rebounce re-trigger your skyclave apparition you're potentially answering multiple permanents on your opponent's side that may have been a problem exactly and it was used similarly in the black white taxes with like tide hollow sculler because of the way i was talking about stacking triggers a minute ago you could get rid of a card out of their hand permanently with tide hollow sculler plus flicker wisp coming in at instant speed so it's just something to keep in mind as a possibility here too consult your judge friends yeah so in conclusion for skyclave apparition i think if you like playing any card of any kind of white creature based strategies in modern or possibly even in pioneer skyclave apparition has a lot of potential to stick around and see a lot of play in the future so this card in and of itself total sleeve and quite honestly i don't have much to say about the other cards tested or at least as much to say about the other cards tested, because this one like really stole the show for me. While playing with Maul of the Skyclave, when we talked about it last week, Dave had posited that it's probably a nice new finisher for Stoneforge decks. You know, after you've run out of other Stoneforge targets, you can fetch this later in the game and just kind of turn the corner and close it out. And in my testing, I found that this was more or less the case exactly. Uh, and in fact, after playing a league and a bunch of practice matches, I actually didn't really feel particularly convinced that this was going to be an auto include in every Stoneforge package moving forward. Because I think the question that you have to ask yourself when considering this card is whether or not it would do its job better than another sword or even another copy of Batterskull might. Because if all you want is a finisher, I actually still think Batterskull is better and gives you more support in like important or specific matchups in modern. And likewise, unlike the other swords, Maul by itself doesn't really give you card advantage. And frankly, I think that's just a cost to cutting whatever sword that you might remove to make room for this. In fact, I think some of the potential flexibility that you know this archetype taxes loses by going mono white could in fact be mitigated by the swords that you can play with Stoneforge. And when you opt to run Sky Mall, I suspect that your plan actually becomes more narrow instead of having more tools, depending on what your opponents are trying to do. 
I do have a couple of thoughts here as well. And most of these were prompted by a really nice discussion in our modern channel on the Slack today by a couple of different patrons, including Sam and Craig, Mickey and Kyle. The uh, the one thing I want to say was, you know, Sam suggested that Maul is the best thing to get if you think Stoneforge Mystic is going to die, which I think is interesting because that uh, you're not restricted in the, um, you know, you get the audio auto equip as part of that, and so if you don't want Batter Skull, then it's a good thing to pull into your um, onto your battlefield because you have a little bit of flexibility there to put it on something else. But the big one that I thought was interesting and worth pointing out and mentioning is just that um, you can play it as a combat trick because it can equip at instant speed. And so if someone doesn't see it coming, you're involved in some blocking or something like that, or somebody tries to lightning bolt a card that you don't want to have lightning bolted, you can flash in Maul of the Skyclaves for a little bit of extra kind of uh, utility there. Not something you can do with the the swords. Well, that's... A little bit of a corner case because when are your opponents not going to see Sky Maul coming after you've cast Stoneforge Mystic and fetched it and kept up Stoneforge Mana, which is your only way of flashing it in? Mm, good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, here's the thing. In my league, one of my losses was to the green-white taxes mirror, and it was a really tough matchup. And the reason they ultimately outplayed me was because they had access to more swords than I did where my QB turtle deck was only running fire ice maul and batter skull. And like, I got the feeling that they were able to act. So they had light and shadow, which just ended up being a bomb in the matchup. But I have a feeling they probably had feast and famine as well. Can't say for sure, but that's kind of what brought me to this conclusion. That's like, if you're cutting out a sword, like this isn't necessarily better than swords. It's just filling a different role. And I think you kind of have to ask yourself like what, role you need to fill with that slot for your plan and for the metagame before you just like blindly put in this new equipment just because it is good but that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best card in that slot so even though it was fine and it did provide like a very sweet target when i was ready to turn that corner ultimately i'm not sure this deck really needs maul to solve any specific problems and that's why for this card at least i'm kind of like a believe or a believe minus happy to find that it's better over time but Right now, I don't think it's like the truth in the same vein that Apparition is. Last card I got to test was Archon of Amiria. This one was just in my sideboard, but um, I actually can see an argument for playing it main because this card is on plan for this deck, period. Even though it's at 3 CMC, it's a little slow. The effect is super powerful and synergizes nicely with Thalia in particular. The problem is it doesn't synergize that great with Path, Ghost Quarter, and Field of Ruin. Uh, but you don't always have Arbiter out when you decide to use those. And I think that the thing that Archon does great is it taxes your opponent's resources to accrue tempo advantage for you later in the game as it gets more grindy. In fact, I think the real reason to play this card is the first line of text, which is basically Eidolon of Rhetoric. And like the land ability is kind of gravy if and when you can pull it off. Uh, the difference between this and Eidolon is that it has two power and flies, So while Eidolon used to sit around and sniff its farts, Archon is actually a threat that you can potentially equip swords or sky malls to, or batter skull for that matter. And like I said, when you couple it with Thalia on turn two, being at three CMC doesn't seem so bad anymore because where Thalia provides some early game tempo, Archon helps you maintain that tempo in the mid to late game while you're providing a threat as well. Um, I think there's an issue that it dies to bolt, unlike Eidolon. But also every creature in this deck dies to bolt except like Restoration Angel. So maybe that's not really a threshold that this deck needs to meet to be good. But at the end of the day, I would just say this card, probably a Belief Plus. It's a good tool to have. I don't think it necessarily elevates White's power level as profoundly as Apparition does. But if you need an Eidolon effect and Eidolon is a little too derpy, Archon of Emeria seems like a really solid replacement or upgrade even for that slot. All right. What do you think about the deck, Stan? I, I just think it's a sleeve. And one of the reasons why I picked it up was because it seemed relatively good in the first place. For one, I think it's a great time to be playing taxes in general. A lot of non-creature spells flying up, flying around right now. And if you're on the play and you cast the Thalia, like you're going to accrue a lot of important tempo that can help you close out games while your opponent struggles to recover. 
But also, I don't think this deck, as we've seen historically with, with tax strategies, has to be tier one to be good. Like, this is the type of deck that has a really interesting and unique plan that can steal games from opponents that aren't expecting it. I also, like, came out feeling like this might be a decent deck for people who are trying to get into modern or looking for, like, a second deck because it has a lot of tools that you can then spin off and evolve into other decks. Mm -hmm. Like, your four Aether Vial, your four Thalia can eventually turn into humans or spirits. If you're playing Eldrazi and Taxes, you can like eventually build Eldrazi Tron. And I I sort of love that Taxes kind of exists in this realm as like a gateway deck, so to speak, for other really good and popular strategies in modern. And to bring it back to an earlier point, like I want to see the day that white is no longer this obvious worst color in modern. And I think that this deck highlights one step in what might be a concerted effort from Watsi to improve white's power level in the color pie in the color pie because as decks evolve over time or or new decks emerge with whatever innovations or cards happen to be on the horizon i think apparition has the qualities of a reason to play white and at the end of the day the color needs more cards like that to be consistent and strong cuz like until now it was often just like i'm playing white so i guess that means i get to play path or maybe some sideboard cards but when you have like other reasons to play white and you can be like oh i'm in white i can play apparition as well as we have more powerful effects and more powerful tools like that we get to see this card or this color get better which for me isn't just like arbitrary more balance in magic i think is a net good thing for the game at least for the formats that we play awesome let's leave it from stan mono white taxes and modern do it it's back shane yeah take us through it Oh man! As usual, we're running low on time. So, yeah, man, Stan. I, whenever we do these, I know that I just know, I know how Stan works. He's effusive. I love it. No, I love to see it. It's all of us. No, it's not. No, I never. I never talk for more than seventeen point five minutes. Oh sure. I'm I'm eating into my time right now. Hey, Dave had a lot to say about taxes too. As it I did. Out. I I do have. I taxes was like my the second deck I built or the third deck I built in modern. So. All right, well, I'm talking about Pioneer. The reason I did that because you all tested some modern, and so I thought, hey, might as well. Uh, and like I mentioned, I'm looking at this landless graveyard combo deck, and the reason I chose to play it is it, it placed in six different builds of it, placed in sixth place and seventh place of a recent Pioneer challenge. I played the sixth place list mainly just because it uh, finished better, but you'll hear me later. I think that there are a lot of advantages potential advantages to the seventh place list. Um, sixth place was by Aluren85. Seventh place was by Andy C 1986 So Dave, I'm glad to see some players closer to our age bracket uh, with 85 and 86 here. So I ran out uh, Aluren85, sixth place deck. And I think fundamentally it's fair to call this like a landless combo deck. And it uses two different enablers to mill your entire deck uh, preferably on turn four. And what that will do for you is put a bunch of creatures into play and also create a 24 point, uh, life swing in your favor with four creeping chills being triggered as well. Yeah. So this is another entry in the catalog of decks that's emerging. That's like mill your whole deck, double face cards, creep and chill you four times, and then figure out how to close the game. Basically. Exactly. Creeping chill, creeping chilling somebody, creep chilling someone four times uh, is rather nice. Um, it's it's a crazy amount of damage for free. So you might be asking me, Shane, if you mill your entire deck, you have no lands. Uh, how are you avoiding losing the next turn? And so what this deck features is a few world spine worms. And what those do is if they're put into the graveyard from anywhere, they get shuffled back into your library, which then gives you uh, one or two draw steps depending on how many you had in your hand already, how many you play in your deck. Uh, what's interesting though, is these also synergize well with the uh, haunted deads that are in your deck because you can pitch a world spine worm and another card to the haunted dead in the graveyard. You put the worm back in the library. You can repeat that process a few times to give yourself a few draw steps. That also is a handy way to retrigger prized amalgams that might have been, let's say, blocked by larger creatures on the other side of the battlefield. Maybe you had to block them. Maybe they got raft. Um, so that's you know kind of the general plan. Uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. So let's talk about 
how this deck is built and is designed to work. So this is like we've been saying, it's, like it's designed around the, the new flippy lands. They're not land cards in your deck, they're spells. And so the two enablers of Undercity Informer and Balustrade Spy take advantage of that by um, having an ETB ability or a, a sack ability that mills you until you find a land. You have no lands, you mill your whole deck, right? Um, so when you resolve Spy or uh, use Informer's ability, this is what happens. You trigger all your creeping chills that aren't in your hand. That triggers all your silver smoke ghouls that got milled into your graveyard. Then that triggers all your prize amalgams. And then that also triggers whatever number of world spine worms you have in your deck and you milled over because those go back into your library so you don't deck yourself. So then your graveyard after that is a pile of nonsense <laughs> and a few haunted deads, basically. Okay. Um, that work with the world spine worm in your hand, like I mentioned. Um, maybe a driven to despair, dis- driven to despair rather, uh, to cast the despair side, um, the aftermath card. This mm-hmm. wasn't in my deck, but I really think it should have been. Because what despair is a good card. Yeah, despair is a one and a black sorcery with aftermath, so you can cast it from your graveyard. It gives all creatures you control menace. And that also causes the opponent to discard a card for every creature that you have that deals combat damage to them this turn. Uh, That text is mostly irrelevant because it's probably just a finisher at that point. Um, They have to have two creatures block all of your creatures. So it's a really good way to ensure that your board of six or seven creatures is going to be wide enough to go around whatever board they might have. Um, Because they're going to be at what, like five or six life likely. Um, maybe eight, you know, if because you got the the twelve point life loss from your creeping chills, then that's already getting the job started. So the mana is a number of the blue and black flippy lands, at least in the build I played. Other builds look like they're doing what we talked about last week in modern, which is where people are just playing the sort of lightning bolt lands just to get the lands into play untapped, right? Like they might be playing a red one or a green one, even if they can't cast the spells on the spell side. And I'll talk a little bit more about that thought process later for sure. Um, you know, some of these lands have ostensible utility, like they could be cast for the spell side. Like Jawari Disruption is a two mana four spike. Hagra Mauling is a really expensive removal spell. You know, even Palaka Predation. I hate the name of these spells, by the way. As a there is a <laughs> pricey hand disruption spell uh, that can make like remove a Wrath or a Planeswalker if you need to. How often did and, you cast them? Um. I like the four spike. Okay. I like Jawari Disruption. Um, I cast Hagra Mauling in a game that I lost, but it gave me an out to not lose. Um, and I don't think I ever cast Palaka Predation. All right. Um, besides the lands, uh, you get a bunch of hand disruption spells. And the thought process there, I imagine, is to protect your combo and disrupt the opponent long enough so that you can go off. And so you're going to see four thoughtsies, of course, and there's spells like some decks run Thought Erasure, some decks run Collective Brutality, and that's the deck. Yeah, and to be clear, the combo here really is just... I'm going to cast this spell. I'm going to cast this creature that mills me. Like that's, that's the combo. Yeah. The co- the combo is creature and lands, right? Like cre- Creature and lands to ca- creature and mana. So thought sees and thought erasure are almost here to protect you from somebody else's thought sees and thought erasure. Yes. And that's one thing that I really, I didn't love that dynamic. Mm-hmm. Cause it, it's like, it's like I'm thought seizing your thought seizes or like, I'm, it's just, it, it was a really bizarre dynamic, especially in a blue bat black deck where it's like, Shouldn't I be playing counter magic? Maybe like, I don't know. There's, I have some thoughts about this. So playing the deck is really straightforward, right? Like you mold to a hand with like one of your eight enablers and hopefully enough lands to cast the thing. Everything else is gravy, right? Like your post board games, like maybe, you know, you need a particular piece of interaction. Like you sideboard in some fatal pushes, you sideboard in some duresses or, you know, things like that. Like you might want to mulligan for those, um, but it's mostly a combo deck. And like I said, the combo is mana and a card. And so on turn four, unless the opponent is representing counter magic or has like a single use piece of graveyard interaction, like maybe they have a Tormont's Crypt or maybe they have um, the staff. What the, I never can remember that thing. The You know what I'm talking about? The thing in Pioneer. Oh, Soul Guide Lantern. Yeah, Soul Guide Lantern. The la- not a staff at all. It's a lantern. Not not a good description. No, it's ter- it's a terrible one. So like unless unless they're holding up something that could stop you from going off, like you cast your thing on turn four if you can and go for it. And so the majority of your your decisions in the gameplay is like your land sequencing. 
because you have, and, and your early disruption and interaction spells, if you have any. So like most of your lands are coming into play tapped. So you're not typically able to play that turn one Thoughtseize or a turn one Fatal Push or like even a turn two Thought Erasure because you need to bring a lot of lands into play tapped and it's taking you off your tempo. But some of those spells, like I said, the Jewelry Disruption is like a Forest Spike that's useful. And I definitely miss sequenced a few times where it's like, oh, I should have brought this land into play turn one and then this learned play, land into play turn two so we could keep a Jewelry Disruption or something like that. So you have to really think about your sequencing and it's not always super obvious that a card is even a land. So like you have to, you know, like I missed once when I was like, Oh, that was like that. That was like coming to play tap land. It's just a little symbol in the lower left. It's like, you got to look at these things pretty closely. Ugh, That's annoying. And you, and like really knowing the CMC of spells that could matter on your opponent's side can be useful. Right? So it's like, okay, I'm on the play uh, on turn three. My opponent is playing a deck that could run like a three mana surgical effect in Pioneer. And I want to be able to play a piece of hand disruption on turn two or have like a counter spell up if I can on their turn three. And why, so it's, that's wh- why didn't you name the card that's the three mana? Because there's like three of them. There's like, there's, there's like, there's Lost Legacy and like that new, like Necro Monocom. Like there's like, there's like three different versions of the same spell. All right. You're right. Um, they're all slightly different slash better than each other. Um, but there's not a lot of decision points, right? Which is kind of boring. But I'll first talk about some of the strengths. Like when you go off, you go off. Like even if the opponent has a decent board on their side, you're usually getting like seven or so three power creatures. And if you cast the four mana of the Balustrade Spy, uh, that's just like a two damage flyer that sticks around. So you might get like seven or eight creatures on the board pretty easily for when you're untapping and swinging in. So even if you lose a few of those to strong blockers, like you're getting a bunch of damage in, you already got a bunch of uh, life loss from the creeping chills. And even if you lose a few of your, like say prize amalgams to some strong blockers, like you can just get them back with a haunted dead trigger um, as well from the yard. So it works out pretty nicely. And the haunted dead trigger gets you a flying spirit and another body. So there's a lot of ways to keep the board wide enough that you can likely finish your opponent off. Um, it's funny. I didn't even always mind having a creeping chill stuck in your hand because this isn't like dredge. We're getting four mana is kind of a pain in the butt. Like you you want to have four mana anyway, and you can hard cast it to trigger your silver smoke ghouls. Like maybe they trade it off or maybe they died to a blocker then you have a late game way to trigger ghoul back again with a creeping chill hard cast or i just won with a creeping chill hard cast which kind of surprised me because my opponent knew that three of them triggered not all four so they knew i must have had the last one in hand and they let themselves go down to like two life so it was just kind of like just a misplay i think but believe it or not i've seen some of some decks like this only running three creeping chills in modern so they might just not know Modern, you get so much, and there's other ways to get the damage in. I feel like in this deck, it's just like some three power creatures. Like I really want four, for sure. Um, But those are the strengths, right? It goes off and you frequently just win when you go off. But it's the weaknesses are, it's so fragile. Like Thoughtseize is like the most popular spell and probably the most played card in the entire format. And dodging a Thoughtseize for like three turns can feel super challenging. Like you don't have a lot of great ways to protect against it besides thoughts using them first or duressing them first. And like, and then post sideboard, there's so many ways for people to hit out your strategy, right? Like they can have graveyard disruption and all the usual suspects. Um, And what makes them worse, like the one-time effects like Tormod's Crypt or Soul Guide Lantern or something like that is when you, let's say you're playing Dredge, right? You can sort of just do enough dredging uh to, to or you know even if you're playing pioneer you can just fill your graveyard enough where they're like okay i've got to do it now and then you can try to restock in this deck you just mill your deck and then they can and so you you cannot play around a soul guy lantern you cannot play around a tormod script um, you just have to find some kind of interaction that can deal with it or try to get an alternate win con uh, which there are some in the sideboard um, and then there's like the surgical effects like necromentia that can remove like your world spine worm. And that just makes your, you're going to deck yourself or you can finish them off. Um, cards like even rampaging Ferocidon, 
do really good work against you because they stop the creeping chill life gain. And so you can't, you know, you can't pull out of like a really low life total against something like mono red. Uh, and you're likely just going to die because they've already done so much damage to you as you've been setting up your combo. And you can just get out aggroed, right? Like, you know, may, or have an opponent set up like something like an all seed of life's bounty and an aura's deck and get this huge, crazy life linker that you don't have any good ability to interact with at least main deck. And like, they have like a 12 power village vigilant life linker that you really don't have a way to outgrind because they can just put their life total to such a point that you are likely forced to deck yourself at some point. Like you're going to run, run out of haunted deads or something like that. So, you know, I think there's probably ways to extend your gameplay for a long while, but it's, you're going to have a hard time fighting through something like that. And there's just, there's just the mana is so bad. Shane, every deck in pioneer, you say the mana is so the bad. Is, well, the, well, here's well, I think, I think the <laughs> mana in this six place deck is questionable because they chose to play a lot more coming to play tap lands that are on color. Mm -hmm. So you take this huge tempo loss constantly as you bring these cards into play. Like you are very rarely able to get your turn four playoff when you want, or even the turn three. Like if you want to bring in the, I always forget the other creature's name, the turn three one, the three mana one that has the one mana activated ability. Like you're very rarely able to cast that on turn three. Maybe you get lucky and you're able to cast the cast the four mana one and go off, but it's, it's, it feels bad. I, I definitely think it needs some more uh, of the off color lands, which I'll talk about in the potential improvements area. There's not a lot of backup plans going on either, right? Like you're on rails. You're hoping to dodge hate. Like, the, there's a couple backup plans in the sideboard. Like there's a full play set of Thassa's Oracle, which I did win with once, but it's not like that is easy to win with on a regular basis. Like you have to be able to say, okay, they're going to have some hate. I'm going to win through the hate in this fashion. And it really has a lack of agency, a lack of decision-making for me. And I didn't find that super fun. Um, Question. Yeah. Decision making in this deck versus modern dredge. Yeah. Is it infinitely more decisions in modern dredge? Like, because There's every time more. I play dredge, I'm kind of like, eh, it kind of feels kind of railsy to me too, but. You know, I mean, I think, I think that there is like, there are the initial rails and then there's like the nuance that's like, okay, well here am I, am I working like my loam plan? Like, or am I, or am I working like an ox plan here? I think there, there are decisions to be made in the mid game that matter. And this, like this deck doesn't really have a mid game. It just sort of has a game. Like it has a, it has an early game and then it has like the turn the corner. Um, potential improvements. I think I do like the Andy C's list. I mentioned, like, I think the like shatter skull smashing and turn timber symbiosis make a lot of sense to me here because they come into play untapped and you're getting probably better value than like the marginal utility of maybe like the spell side of like buying veil or even Juari Disruption. I think Andy C also ran 26 of the lands over Alurin's 20, uh, 28 versus 26. I think that's probably smart. You really want to be hitting your land drops uh, because all you're trying to do is go off on turn four and you have no ramp and you have no rocks, unlike uh, the modern variants of this deck. I also like Collective Brutality over Thought Erasure because it can do a multiple multiple things. Like It can eliminate problem spells also slow down the hyper aggressive starts on the other side of the battlefield, like say like a really good mono red deck or even a mono black deck. And it also can lower the opponent's life total. So like you can also get them down even further than the creeping chills are going to do. And then that makes your combat finish even easier. Um, I might consider running main deck ley lines like the modern version has been doing. Um, it protects against like disruption spells. It protects against some of the hyper-aggressive burn starts. I, I I can see room there potentially for some ley lines uh, or maybe in the sideboard. I don't know. I'm, I was surprised that there are none. So my final grade, um, ugh, it's, <laughs> I, I can't really get behind this deck because it's like, it's, it's powerful and like cute because it's like, Hey, I don't hey, no Oops. All spells. But it's like it's so disruptable. The, the 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 flippy lands have so many downsides. Like they might they have 
come into play tapped. They cause life loss. They might not be in the colors you're playing if you're playing a deck with like, you know, off color lightning bolt lands. And it's not even a guaranteed win if you go off. Like, there's a lot of ways that like your three power creatures on turn five aren't getting the job done, right? Like if I'm doing this, why not just do it with Winota? I just don't know. Like Winota has better mana now and it's more explosive and it has, but I think it has more ways to survive interaction. Famously than, another deck that you don't like that much. Well, I mean, I'm going to revisit it. I want to play Cobra and the pathways pathways. Yes. Thanks. I think it's a heave. It's like maybe a heave plus maybe you believe minus at best, which is crazy to say about a deck that finished sixth and seventh in a, in the challenge. But I think that might be like an aberration. I would not, I would be surprised to see this deck in this fashion stick around. Like, I think that like auras and mono black aggro are able to run the best spell in the format and thoughts ease as well. While I'll apply significant pressure even earlier on the curve and have maybe recursion with Luris, or they have graveyard recursion with the mono black creatures. Like Winota is super explosive. It can ramp earlier with like mana dorks or Lotus Cobras. Like this just feels like a watered down version of the modern strategy. And it like the, the card pool of pioneer doesn't capital, doesn't allow the strategy to be as strong as I think it is in modern at all. After, after seeing the modern version, um, like try it for yourself, but I wasn't a huge fan. I think it needs ramp. I think it needs like Simeon spirit guide. I think it needs uh pentad prism. I think it needs some mana rocks. And I think that that would make it better than it is, but like, it's, it's just like a mopey turn four. Do I win? And that's not like a great feel. What drew you to it in the first place? Well, I think because it was a graveyard strategy that did well and it uses the flippy lands and like, it's a, it's a new strategy in pioneer that did well. So that's basically it. People called it dredge too. Yeah. Which, you know, you wanted to have a look under that hood. One of Shane's three decks. I ain't calling it that. Shane refuses to call it that after playing it. Okay. So Shane thinks this deck is a heave. It, it doesn't sound promising to me in some ways, but I want to take a quick second here because we definitely gained some time back on Shane's run through of a deck he hated. Stan, you spent some time playing the Underworld combo deck, right? And which is not really that different than this deck, although it's more complicated. Like it's got it's got other weirdness going on that takes advantage of Modern's card pool. H- how are you feeling about just these like li- landless decks in both formats at this point? So when I tried playing that Undercity combo deck for the first time in my life, I felt like I hadn't done enough homework to even know how to play the deck in the first place. Like I hadn't played against it. I just saw a list and kind of figured I understood it, but it was above my pay grade and I I had no idea what I was doing. And like, maybe if I had seen it in action, I could have grasped it better, but I ultimately like pulling back the curtain. I thought I was going to talk about that deck and ended up with mono white because like, I just didn't know what I was supposed to do in the Belcher decks that I was like, screw this, this is not for me, I'm going to have more fun and put together a better assessment of a deck that I actually know how to play. I mean, I think that's great. Do you think it's a real deck and and other people could play it? Or do you think that this is another like thing where we're like, eh? You know, Shane, I know you watched Squatch Chief play the modern version of this deck this afternoon. So, I mean, I welcome opinions from either one of you here about the the realness of these decks at this point. Oh yeah. I think he was just saying he's had multiple four ones. It's like, it. I think he like, he's played entire leagues, like in, you know, 15 minutes. What? I mean, like, yeah, it's just like, they're, it's just, uh, you know, outrageously fast. Just farming tickets basically. Well, Dave define real deck. I mean, multiple four ones starts to become real. It was certainly a, I mean, the modern version was in the top eight of the mana trader series. I mean, do we think you tried to play it? Like I said, I mean, I've tried to play a lot of things, my friend. <laughs> yeah, true. True. <laughs> like, is this a meme deck or are we going to be talking about this three or four weeks from now and be like, what's your sideboard plan against oops, all spells. So at time of recording, I think it's more important to have a sideboard plan against mill than Belcher. Okay. This could turn around, but I think Belcher is probably just going to end up in the same category as Neoform, where you're like, you, you have to know how to play against it in the long term, but I don't necessarily right now see it becoming like a, a staple. Shane, similar thoughts, or what do you think? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like I, I don't have a final judgment on this stuff right now. Um, 
yeah, I, I don't I don't like it in Pioneer. I think it looks strong in modern. I think it has some of the same weaknesses and interaction points that could, you know, hamstring it. But for now, you know, play the bust deck, right? Here's what I think. Pack your thoughtsies. Speaking of thoughtsies, I'm gonna introduce myself for the third third deck of the night. So as I mentioned earlier, I played Racto Shadow this week and it was sweet. <laughs> Why was it sweet? Let me know. I mean, look, I think people are probably pretty familiar with this deck. It seemed like it was pretty popular in the leagues when I was playing. But here's what it is. It is Black Red Death Shadow with Scourge of the Skyclaves. And it's basically like Death Shadow decks and Prowess decks had a baby that is even more beautiful than either one of them. (laughs) And that's why I picked up this deck. As, As all babies are. Yeah, exactly. Until they get teenagers and weird. I mean, here's the thing. We talked about this earlier. Multiple people on I've seen on Twitter have said that this is the best aggro deck in the format right now. Mm. It had the distinction of being the top of the meta game of Mana Traders Tournament over the weekend. 20 people played it. It had the best performing win percentage in the Swiss, and it was the only 9-0 deck in the tournament this week. And it's a combination of two of my favorite decks. The prowess mechanic is here to an extent, and some of the cards that make prowess good are in this deck. And then Death Shadow is here, and some of the cards that make Death Shadow good are in this deck, along with Luris. And so you get this kind of interesting, aggressive-ish build. Not quite Zoo Shadow, not quite Black Red Prowess, where you can establish an early game plan via our favorite Creatures, Monastery, Swift Spear, and Soul Scar Mage to enable both Death Shadow and Scourge of the Skyclaves. So, like we mentioned, the main new thing in this deck, and you know, we've seen Prowess and Shadow kind of reunite a couple of times in the past. Like I mentioned, the the zoo decks are kind of like this because they have Monastery Swift Spear in them. There's other times when people have have messed with really aggressive shadow builds, you know. The main thing is that this was enabled by Scourge of the Skyclaves. So the mythic that we all thought was going to happen, that I've been talking about the last couple of weeks, it is a colorless and a black for a star star that says Scourge of the Skyclaves power and toughness are each equal to 20 minus the highest life total among players. You know, Scourge of the Skyclaves, it's big, it's dangerous, it's a demon, it's risky, it's got a kicker you'll never use. Who needs it? Yeah, who needs it? And I I don't think anybody's surprised that this card found a home, right? Like it was clear from the spoiler episodes that this card had good rate and might be basically the black Tarmogoyf. Like that's kind of how people are thinking about it because it's a two drop. But what it really is, is that, you know, I'm I'm kind of surprised that this de- this card has gotten as popular as it has as fast as it has. It's only taken like ten days, but again, the rate is so good. Maybe it's just hard to deny that it that it was going to find multiple homes. But really, what this does is it provides uh, redundancy with Death Shadow in a in a deck that often benefited greatly from having a giant creature to attack with when you got your shadows up online. I mean, think about times when you've played Death Shadow and you've dropped two shadows in a single turn. Yeah, it's outrageous. And you're like, okay, now we're doing it. You know, I have two seven sevens. What are you going to do about it? This lets you have plays like that much more often. So it's a second payoff for playing at a low life total. It takes away the tension decks like this have had in finding Death Shadow in the past, right? So in other builds of Death Shadow, you had to play, didn't have to, but you would play things like Traverse, right? So you would have Traverse so that you would have redundant copies of your threats. Go get a Shadow if it's the right situation for that. Go get a Tarmogoyf if it's a better situation for Tarmogoyf. That's great. Other versions, play Cantrips. You know, we're playing Mishra's Bauble here to help uh, make our, our deck smaller, But you would play Serum Visions and Grixis back in the day to be able to try to get to the cards that you want to find. Here, you just have one of your payoffs more often because now you have Scourge and Death Shadow both. And so the draws where you get multiples of them out or the the games where you get two out within the first three or four turns can be really wild. The other thing is that it provides a massive, Scourge provides a massive incentive for this deck to be more aggressive and move away from mid range. And that's where having Prowess and Soulscar Mage in the deck becomes a lot more kind of interesting and uh, possible because 
you want your life to- your opponent's life total down as fast as possible as much as you want your own life total down as fast as possible. So bolts and the prowess pack, the prowess twins become the natural companion to it. And then having Luris on top is like the little cherry on top out of your sideboard to be able to have a mid game plan that you can convert to is just kind of where you want to be. So really made possible by by Scourge, I think, is the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, just re- this redundancy, right? And redundancy is one of the I think I've, I've realized that the more we have had these spoiler episodes and talked about new decks that appear is like when you have more than four things doing very similar things in your deck. That's just something to be aware of and watch for. And that's why we have started watching for it. Yeah. And it's a, it, it helps your plan work out over the long term better, I think. The other new cards that are in the deck, Agadim's Awakening. Uh, we talked about it. You know, it's black, black, black and X colorless uh, that says return from your graveyard to the battlefield. Any number of target creature cards that have a different converted mana cost X or less. You know, this is just it's a one of it's a nice card to have. Because the best case is you get back a Shadow and a Scourge. Maybe somehow you get Luris back too in some kind of wombo combo version, but that's not super likely to happen. But because it's one of these lands that comes into play, does three damage to you if you would rather have a land, there's really no downside to playing it. It's a nice companion to Unearth. Like Unearth has its own kind of utility. So a lot of these decks seem to be running one Agadim's Awakening and one on Earth, or one Agadim's Awakening and no on Earth. You know, the guy, the person who went, uh, Al Nash, who went 9 in the Mana Trader series was not running on Earth. The deck I was playing was. But it just helps the deck be more consistent. And honestly, just taking three from the natural draw sometimes is good here. And so it's it keeps up with your rate on Fetch Shocks, which helps get your life total down and turns on all your cards. The next card, the next couple cards are sideboard cards. So it has Feed the Swarm in the side and has Cleansing Wildfire in the side as well. Both really interesting and important pieces of tech. You know, Feed the Swarm, we know what it does. It's two, two mana for a sorcery that kills a creature and does, or an enchantment and does the CMC to you in damage, life loss, I mean. But those are both useful things. You want your life total to be lower. Um, you'd like to kill a big creature sometimes that's cheap that you can't kill with a lightning bolt or a fatal push maybe. And sometimes you want to get rid of an enchantment. Do you think that enchantment text is the only reason you play this over dismember? Uh, well, I mean, the thing that this does is that it can kill a primeval Titan or something like that if you really need it to. And so I found myself thinking a lot about like the matchup that I'm in, am I playing dismember or am I playing feed the swarm? Like, and that, that's kind of where it was at. And occasionally I would have both in, but it was more kind of like picking which one, which one of those two cards I wanted the enchantment text. I actually wonder a little bit if it's not, if it's even less useful than it looks like at first. Cause I don't really know what I was going to try to kill with this because, um, you know, I brought in feed the swarm against Leyline of sanctity one time, but that was against Tron because I also had other things I wanted to kill with Feed the Swarm and Tron, notably, you know, being able to kill and make smaller a Worm Coil engine is kind of helpful out of this deck, and you only have so many options to do that. You do have Coligan's Command, of course, as well, and and other things, a Braid and stuff like that, but it was just kind of like, I want to up my, like, uh, anti-artifact creature cards, and so this was kind of like a 50-50 shot in that way as well. But the life total is supposed to be a drawback. And for this deck, it is not a drawback at all, of course. And then the second card is that, you know, the version that I was playing was playing four cleansing wildfire in the sideboard. I see that the mana traders nine O deck was not running cleansing wildfire. It was running Kroxa and it was running collective brutality and it was running Kozilex return. I, I think that cleansing wildfire is fine and interesting out of a deck like this, but it's not necessarily a shoe in to have in the sideboard. Like, I don't think you have to have it, but I'll tell you what, it did help me against the underworld combo decks because I had in one game, I had a double cleansing wildfire draw where I just destroyed their lands and then they scooped. And it was like, there's not really much they can do about that. You know, you thought seize them and cleansing wildfire them and you just kind of like move on with your day. So how is this deck new or different? I mean, the real thing that happened here is we had a combination between two tempo aggro decks come together and become one thing again. If prowess is moving off a little bit, 
you know, especially the blue red prowess and things like that, because we want some bigger threats because the bigger threats that are available are good and consistent and useful. You know, I think that, and there's another version of the prowess deck that's becoming more Oboshi, kind of like mono red with a little bit of a late game plan. You know, this is just kind of a natural evolution of those two pieces coming together. Cheap disruption, cheap creatures, and cheap removal is kind of like where where we're at with even with this version of Shadow. I mean, one of the hallmarks of Shadow is like it's all cheap spells dot deck. And this is still there. So many different cards from so many different builds were replaced, so it's hard to kind of say that it's like a one-for-one -one swap for this, for that, for that. But you know, Luris plus Shadow plus everything. I think this is just a better version of the Shadow Zoo deck that we thought was going to be coming around. I feel like this is just more versatile and has a little bit better late game plan than the decks that are all in on like Aquam Hellhound and Monastery Swift Spear and Shadow and Scourge and Teamer Battle Rage and uh, Become Immense. Mm -hmm. So why is that? <laughs> they tell us. And the fact is, Scourge is a Scourge of the Skyclaves is almost laughably easy to enable. You know, so many decks in modern, I and mean, we talked about this in the spoilers, but as I'm playing with the card more and more, so many decks do damage to themselves. They don't have any other way to get their mana going other than to do damage to themselves. That Scourge just becomes really big, really fast almost every game, especially when you give people a little bit of a push with a Lightning Bolt or a uh, Monastery Swift Spear or both. You know, where all of a sudden you're at 14, your opponent's at 13, and on turn three, you play a two mana six, six, you know, and then it's just kind of like the next turn I'm going to play, I'm going to get my life total lower and I'm going to play a one mana six, six with a death shadow. It, it's really not a, it's not any kind of barrier to play at all. And then as we talked about last week, it feels like like Scourge really makes Team or Battle Rage become a lot better just on its own because of that wild kind of burst damage that you can do with a Scourge and Team or Battle Rage if your life totals have been maneuvered in the right way. So just as a reminder, talked about it last week, but because you hit twice with Team or Battle Rage because it gives double strike, Scourge's power and toughness have a high likelihood of changing between the first strike combat step and the actual combat damage step. And for example, I hit somebody for 15 on turn four <laughs> with one scourge because they were at, they were at 15 and I was yeah. at 12. And then I attacked with my scourge hit them for, I had it, uh, team of battle raged it lightning bolted myself to move myself to nine the scourge hit them for five to move them to 10 and then hit them for 10 yeah i'll take it and that's it that sounds good you know yeah how did that make you feel i mean it was incredible because they had just previously blast zoned me and took got rid of two soul scar mages as well on on turn four so as all this combat was going on i was like you're still gonna die because i have team of battle rage and you can't do anything about it and i think really it this deck makes that card a lot better than it has been in other versions of Shadow, where it's a good card. It's still a good card, even with, with Shadow on its own. But it just feels like it goes together so well with this other threat as well that it's just kind of like, now I want to run too. Now I'm happy to draw it more often, where sometimes you draw a team or battle rage and like Grixis Shatter, and you're like, all right, I got some work to do before this is a card. It almost always felt like it was live when you get it in this deck. And then the last thing is, there's a lot of incentive to run more protection type spells in this deck, even though you're not like dipping your toe into blue because both uh, you have more kind of like Queens to protect. You basically have eight Queens to protect now in that, in this kind of like parlance of what certain aspects of shadow are like, but you also have want to do things like play Phyrexian mana spells to get your life total down even faster. So you're playing Apostle's Blessing, which can protect someone from a removal spell, but can also occasionally uh, evade blockers. And also you're playing Mutagenic Growth because you're playing those one, two prowess creatures that really benefit from having a couple of Mutagenic Growths around to help with Lightning Bolt. And so you're doing stuff like that that helps you cast extra spells. And so this really becomes this like Phyrexian mana deck as well at this point and we all know how broken those cards are really mm -hmm. questions 
before I go on to final judgment? I, I'll actually save my question for final judgment because I think it's related. Okay, final judgment. This oh, no, I got a question. I got a question. I've got a, I got a, one or two questions. Okay, so I think you talked a lot about sort of the performance of the cards and kind of like how it played out, but how did it feel? And I know that's like that's kind of like a really generic thing to ask, but like you played a lot of decks like this. Did you sort of feel like it was? you know, very aggressive or like just aggressive enough that it didn't like have no end game at all. Like, did it just, did it feel like every piece was, was playing off each other well, or that like, you know, it, some stuff was feeling shoehorned in there. Like how final did this feel? I, I, and I actually want to add something to Shane's question because I think I, I have a similar thought. Does it feel like a revised death shadow list or does it feel like an improved death shadow list? Here's what I'd say. I think that having spent some time playing John Death Shadow and Luris Prowess Aggro, both in the last few months, it feels like a superior version of both of those decks to me because every card I drew, I felt like I knew what I was supposed to be doing with it right at the time that I had it. Now, that to me, that statement kind of implies that the deck is a lot more aggressive than either one of those two builds because you're not trying to think ahead quite so much a lot of times but when i played the red black prowess deck for our prowess like dive deep dive episode there were a lot of moments where i was like and and who are you and what are you for when i drew it (laughs) and this deck felt a lot more tight in the sense of like it's really clear what all these cards are for all the time like there's not a there's there's kind of combat and aggro gameplay going on in here but there's not a lot of question of like oh i need to wait to be able to do this or i've got to do that or blah 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 blah. like it feels like i would say it feels like an improved rakdos prowess list more than it feels like an a different death shadow list in some ways but that difference is kind of academic right The mid game on here is definitely good because of Luris and Agadim's Awakening, because you get a chance to get some stuff back from the graveyard. You have to be very precious with those things because you can have those plans disrupted pretty easily. But it felt pretty settled to me for now. I mean, it's an easy sleeve for me. I mean, I'm good. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's like a reason that this deck is good right now, other than the fact that Thoughtseize is quite good right now. Um, and always good, but I think it's kind of extra good at the moment, and Lightning Bolt is still pretty good. And so I think that that might be why this particular build is really popular. If it continues to be popular, I mean, I played the Mirror twice when I was first piloting this deck. Wow. So I think if we get to a point where it gets really, really popular like that, people are going to start to adjust for it, and maybe something like Taxes will be more popular or something like that. I mean, but it's really easy to say that Scourge is just a legit card. And they'll probably be shells that are just built around Shadow plus Scourge going forward. You mentioned that um, this is like the best aggro deck right now, or at least people are saying so. Do you think this might be the best deck in modern right now? Uh, I would be surprised if that was true in an objective sense, just because aggro is usually not the best, best deck. I think it depends on how you define it. Like, I think this is probably the best deck for me in modern right now which is meaningful i think it's an objectively good deck and we've had some results that indicate that it is good so i'll be playing it some more just because that's the kind of style of player that i am right now but i would be surprised if it continued to be the most popular deck because humans can maybe tech against it a little harder uh maybe some other decks could kind of tech against it like a like decks that gain life a little bit more that really throw off your scourge plan so if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it'll have problems. But I think it's very good. Good. A couple a couple good new versions of modern decks then. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, I definitely think that taxes in this deck are both legit. And in another bad pioneer deck. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> I mean, I mean, quick aside, isn't that's kind of what's bad about Pioneer, right? Is like there's there's like the good decks and the not so good decks. Yeah. I I prepared some notes about playing Phoenix in modern because you know i had to try or sorry playing phoenix and pioneer because Uh, you know i had to try i tried with magmatic channeler i'm not sad that they're cut from this episode you played one one match 
Didn't you just play one match, though? No, I played a league. Oh, okay. Sorry. Here's what I have to say about that. The short version. Magmatic Channeler is a good card. I, I assume we'll be talking about it again sometime soon in some other place. But I still did not think Phoenix was doing anything. So there's another bad Pioneer deck for you really quick here at the end of the show. All right, we're wrapping up. Can I do an, a quick unscripted plug for some articles Shane's been writing on Goonhammer? Sure. Sure, yeah. What's Goonhammer, and why are you writing articles for them? <laughs> uh, Goonhammer is a site that is run by some something awful forums people, and <laughs> they are known as goons, which is just a, it's just a legacy term at this point. So anyway, Goonhammer... Um, I think if they would, they would probably change the name because they, they, it was originally associated with something awful and it's become much larger. It's one of the more popular Warhammer sites on the internet, actually, and they've been expanding their gaming uh, media in terms of uh, board games and video games and card games. And they recently started up some Magic the Gathering stuff. They actually reached out to us a while ago to start working with them. And I have some time now and I've been trying to convert our episodes into articles that launch more or less simultaneously with uh, the episodes on Friday. So you can check out uh, goonhammer.com on Fridays and hopefully unless things you know, move or transition or my schedule no longer works for it. Right now it's in testing phase. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it's not something that I think people should expect to be there every Friday. And, you know, but right now it's fun and we're we're testing it out. And we're seeing how the the text version of our episodes works and it's been fun to do. And thanks so much to the team at Goonhammer for reaching out to us and inviting us to place some content on their platform. And uh, they make it easy. Like they've got a good editing team. Um, they've got a good web, you know, setup. And so I really appreciate um, their assistance and everything. And yeah, it's been fun. Would you throw it all away to write for Forbes? You know, don't do it again. You already went down that road once. Um, I'm more of a I'm a medium guy. You guys know I did a medium publication, right? Yeah, your uh, your 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 football, the fantasy football. So that was good. Yeah, medium is was pretty good for that. I don't know what their deal is these days, but. Anyway, I still only write for the patch. <laughs> nice. Patch Stan. Sometimes Blo- I dust off my old Zenga. Block Club Stanislav. All right, that wraps up this week's show. Good up, guys. Fun decks. A lot of content. A lot of cards. I counted like, what, 225 between the three of us? <laughs> hey, if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. The longer the review, the more we enjoy it. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast or pick our brain on something in modern or pioneer or really magic at all, tweet us at the dive down, all one word, or email the dive down at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon over at patreon.com slash the dive down. Also shout out to Mana Traders for sponsoring the dive down. You can sign up for Mana Traders using promo code the dive down, all one word, and get 15% off your first three months of renting Magic Online cards. If you already have our 20% discount in effect, that does remain until your first three months are up, but all new Mana Trader signups using our promo code are back to 15% off. I don't think we're being punished. I got the sense that this is happening across the board for all content creators sponsored by Mana Traders. Support who you like. Consider supporting us if you like us. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and try new cards!